It's like a YouTuber to everybody else, essentially, just like through watching them on <laughs> Zoom calls and stuff. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Let me uh, do the formal intro and then we can uh, get going from there. All right. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. Today, we have a really exciting exclusive conversation and interview. We're going to be talking with the one and only YouTube content creator extraordinaire, producer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, app developer, teacher, music theorist, space traveler. We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, Mr. Andrew nah. Huang, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, long overdue. I think you reached out about this a few months ago, and I was like, I just had a baby. Right. So, right. <laughs> yeah, glad we could do this. But th that was that was the first thing I was going to ask you about. One of your latest releases is a collaboration on a mm -hmm. literal human being. And yeah. uh, how's how's that going so far? You know, we are so like we feel like we won the lottery because our baby is like really happy all the time mm. and sleeps well. And I don't know when you figure out, you know, if she needs something and, you know, as soon as you figure it out, she's like, OK, cool. Thanks. She just doesn't, you know, get get weird and, and lose her shit or whatever. Like she's just chill oh, and so so cute and lovely yeah mm -hmm. and and so, i don't know but i mean that's, dad life is great <laughs> again that's uh that's fantastic to hear um that, that it hasn't i guess like you know sort of uh uh interrupted anything you know i mean has has so far I'm, I'm sure leading up to this point there was kind of maybe a feeling of of doubt in terms of like how am i going to balance all of this and do all of this you know like a uh, full-time youtuber full-time parent and everything but you know how is like kind of I guess uh, you're already used to doing so many projects at once anyway. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, yeah. What, what is it like adding a person into the equation now? I'm like definitely dialing back on uh, a lot of the stuff that I might have normally taken on. Um, but yeah, I guess I was really afraid going into I mean, I, I really wanted to have a kid. Uh, we definitely want to have another. But yeah. um, before having your first one, I mean, you just have no idea what you're getting into. Right. And I think I was worried that. You know, I love what I do so much with music and videos and everything that would I be kind of, you know, always hoping to get back to my studio and I don't know, being neglectful or something like that. And the the thing that has been amazing to discover is now with the kid, I actually have so much less of a work life balance issue because now wherever I am, I just love it. I'm like, oh, I get some studio time. That's sick. Or I'm hanging out with my baby. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so. I don't know, for b before it was really difficult where I had that thing that I think a lot of us have where if you're working, you're like, oh, I should be taking care of myself. I should be taking more time off. Mm -hmm. And then when you're just chilling, you're feeling guilty about not being more productive. And it's been really neat that that has kind of evaporated from my life. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it gives you less of a reason to be a workaholic, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So in a weird way, it made my, my balance better. Mm. Um, but I mean, it's the kind of thing that you're always figuring out, you know, and reassessing. Yeah. So when, when you do yeah. find that time to work does and, and be creative generally, um, does it cause you to prioritize that time differently and, and go into that with a different mindset since you may sort of have like a limited amount of space or time to get a certain thing done? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's definitely less wasted time. I pretty much stopped looking at social media for a couple of months, mm. like entirely. And even now it's, it's just cut back so much from, from where I used to be. Um, so that's great because that, you know, it sort of happens throughout the day and you don't realize how much it's adding up. And it's also I can justify a lot of it as being part of work, but right. it's not really high priority most of the time. But um, yeah. And then I think it, I just have to prioritize what I'm actually doing in the studio now. There's not as much time to just like try a new plug in and mess around or um, yeah, definitely have to be a, a lot more decisive about some stuff. And I guess um, I do still this is the one thing I would say I need to work on the most right now is feeling like I can carve out specific time to just play around. Like, even if it's just an hour or two, but I'm like, it's okay to not have an agenda with this, but being able to be a little more freely uh, creative and explorative is part of, you know, what I have to do as I develop new ideas and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's been more structured and part of it is like finding those structured, unstructured times Right. I mean, so much, so much of your like, 
your gear videos and just the fact that your your brain is so deep within this world of like analog synthesis and stuff like that. I mean, that is just like a tinkerer's playground. Like, you know, not everything that you go into doing that with with and for is purposeful. You know, you're you're kind of like just stumbling across great ideas as you're as you're just kind of going blindly into it. Yeah, I think that's been one of the cool things um, that's developed out of me getting into modular synthesis and and kind of um, takes me back to being more of a beginner with a lot of music stuff where you're just exploring and you you don't know exactly what's going to happen a lot of the time. And um, it's kind of made me think about how uh, how a lot of people approach music and and you know, separating a bit of the uh, commodification out of things where I think um, more and more these days when we all have this online uh, persona or presentation of ourselves, we um, end up feeling like the stuff we make is a product in some ways, you know, like if I'm going to experiment with some music stuff, I hope I can turn it into a song. I hope I can release it. I hope we can share it with people, um, which is all great, but also um, it's cool to just get back to that place where I'm just like a kid having fun and, you know, playing with an instrument and nothing, it doesn't have to become something. And it's just like, if it's an hour that I, you know, figured something out or just had fun, then that's a hundred percent cool and valid. Hmm. That That is something that topically I wanted to to ask you about, because I mean, we're, we're about the same age and uh, we probably very vividly remember a time of. Uh, you know, more physical, more analog, like mediums for music and music consumption. And, uh, you know, over the course of all this time, especially with you, you know, being a musician and succeeding uh, for the bulk of your career within the digital age, like, do you think that anything in terms of the magic of music has been lost within the process of it, uh, within the process of it, uh, certainly, sorry, within the process of it, essentially turning into like content, like anything else, just like on any other streaming platform or, or whatever? Yeah, I just saw someone post like some quote, and I don't know who it was, and I don't know who they were quoting, but a, about um, how terrible it is that essentially we stopped calling it art and we started calling it content. Right. And, you know, it's just anything that shows up in your feed now. And um, yeah, I do think that there has been a, a devaluation of of art or, or of music, of all these kinds of things that we used to definitely treasure a bit more when it was harder to access or, you know, more expensive because of the physical media you had to create and, and then consume. Um, and I'm, I don't know, on the one hand, I'm like, that's, that's really sad. I miss the days where you'd save up to buy like a five disc box set and you read the whole liner notes and all that. And then on the other hand, I'm kind of like, is this bringing us back to a place that's a little bit more like what, music used to be, which is it's ephemeral and you really, you have it for the moment that you have it. Mm. And uh, even though now we can you know, hit up a streaming service and just play whatever we want over and over again, it's still like, um, it's an experience uh, each time. And love the, you know, I, I love a vinyl record as much as anybody. I love that tactile experience, but it's also like, that wasn't a part of music for eons mm -hmm. and then we had it for a little moment right and now we're kind of in this this new space which in a way is very new and very technologically uh dependent but then in another way is kind of like maybe a more a more primitive thing mm -hmm. where it's just like yeah it's, music is just in the air and then it's gone mm -hmm. <laughs> no i mean that's that's exactly true i mean music itself is an art form and you know just as a concept has existed for way longer than vinyl records as you know a technology has or you know the ability to replay music so uh wh whatever music is or it's going to be is going to long outlast the need for it to be attached to any physical medium obviously uh but you know i, I think kind of separating it from that or kind of maybe moving outside of that process allows maybe time or space or budget or brain power to experiment on or maybe like focus on other things. I mean, you have this new project out space time, which um, I wanted to go into with you a little bit because there is kind of this really huge in-depth space based time travel based narrative surrounding all of it, which has been, you know, sort of a uh, expressed through a series of videos and in, in a very detailed way, which I mean, obviously like, you know, you're conscious and aware of this, but just for the audience, anybody who's unaware, like, you know, for a 
moment, uh, e- even I was slightly convinced that you were about to go on some kind of astronaut trip. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was yeah. really like, you know, convincing the visuals and everything. And, it, you know, uh, before we get into the music on the record itself, like where exactly did this, you know, the visual and, and the cinematography concept for all of it kind of come into being, uh, you know, did they sort of come together at the same time, be conceived at the same time, or was it sort of an afterthought? Yeah. So, I mean, space time is a project that took up about the last six months on my channel mm-hmm. and, uh, had been in the works for a few years and was really a, a coming together of a whole bunch of things that I was interested in and thinking about experimenting with. And, and it kind of worked out in a way that I felt like I could try out all these things I wanted to try within one project, which would be, um, blurring the line between fiction and reality on my social media and kind of a bit of a commentary on the performative nature of social media and how far you can go with that. And then, you know, just the the literal telling of a sci-fi story right. that would be really fun. Experimenting with YouTube formats. And um, I have the, my, my brother-in-law who handled so many of the visuals. I mean, that it just felt like if I didn't use him for something like this, uh, it would be like a wasted opportunity. Right. And then also, you know, we build up to this cliffhanger where I would not post anything for a couple months. And I was like, you know, YouTubers and, and people who are online take breaks all the time and some make a big deal out of it, some don't. And I was like, what if I do this in such a big way where it's like I have, you know, departed so far from my normal content and it seems like I'm actually uh well, I mean, I don't think anybody would be believing it at that point, but I'm telling this story, showing myself in space. And then, I, you know, I have this terrible accident and then my, you know, all my channels go blank for a while. And so that was just something that I thought would be fun. And, I, you know, I don't even like pranks at all. Like I can't handle the smallest prank, but this is sort of my, like my one troll moment for my <laughs> career where, I mean, I, yeah, I was telling real friends of mine before I launched this that I had the opportunity to go to space just to like see how believable it was. And pretty much everybody was like, you know what, it's it sounds crazy, but we're just at the point, you know, technologically and with what private space companies are doing. And you're like kind of a person who maybe would get an opportunity like this. Right. It it did come together serendipitously with that in 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 a great way. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I was at the beginning of of ideating on it. I wasn't sure if I was going to try and just pretend in kind of a Kaufman-esque way that this was real all the way through and, and you know, for the rest of my life, keep referring to it as if it was something that actually happened. I pretty much uh, realized I would not be able to keep that up. And then I think with how it unfolded, I'm glad I decided not to commit to that because there's a lot of, um, it, I, it would just be way too too difficult. And I think it's better for the fans too, that it's just a self-contained project. Yeah, it it would obviously have to end at some point. But, you know, to to the point that you were making a little bit earlier, like uh, for watching your content for years uh, from watching your content for years, I'm just so used to you being so incredibly sincere. The moment that, you you know, you started like playing with that perception. I was like, wait, is he fucking with me? Like, I don't I don't know. Andrew (laughs) Andrew Huang's never told a lie. Like, I don't. (laughs) Yeah. And so I was thinking, you know, on the one hand, maybe it should have been someone like uh, Nathan for you or like a um, Sasha Baron Cohen or something who should have done a stunt like this. But then at the same time, I'm like, no, if it's a person who's always tried to be so authentic and sincere and all that, I mean, that you know, almost takes it a bit further. <laughs> right. No, for sure. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess uh, off of that, I wanted to note that, you know, this this sort of seems like um, a really huge undertaking visually. But, uh, you know, let's talk about the project musically a little bit, because, you know, obviously there's a lot of dance pop and a lot of uh, futuristic aesthetics, you know, flowing throughout the record, some Daft Punk influences as well that I kind of caught here and there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, what was going into... Uh, the musical, I guess, concept and energy of the project, uh, you know, just kind of a little outside of the the, the narrative uh, concept. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, there's the main album, Space Time, that it all kind of built up to, which, um, yeah, mostly I think sits in this sort of dancey, poppy, synth wavy world. But then there's like a little dubstep rap and then, um, you know, a little a little bit of like 80s arena rock sprinkled right at the end and, and that kind of stuff. Um and it kind of came together 
it, separately at first from the visual part and the story part, I was just thinking about the concept of this project and um, how it would look visually and the story I wanted to tell and how it would meld with my content. But I didn't have really any idea about the music. And at the same time, I've been writing, you know, I write tons of stuff all the time. And I ended up finding that some of this sort of 80s flavored or retro future stuff would fit um, overall with this concept. And so I started developing it like that. And it was a really cool process that, you know, I've never had before where the music and the story and the visuals all, you know, started feeding back on each other with what we needed soundtrack wise and what would accent a story moment versus, you know, what I was inspired to do with the bridge of a song and like all this kind of stuff, um, you know, developed really in tandem um, after a certain point. Uh, and then at the same time, I'll mention too, like throughout the project, I was also dropping little like singles and EPs that sounded totally different here and there, just either because I was also working on that stuff and it was a vehicle to get it out or because there was part of the story where we just needed something so different that I didn't feel like would fit on the space time album. And I was like, Oh, you know what? We'll make that a single and, and it'll just be that. But um, yeah, it was a cool process. Cause it really, uh, you know, it was different than anything I've ever done. Like I've never written a, a musical or anything or songs that would be used for this kind of a visual storytelling thing. So yeah, that was a really cool experience. Yeah. I mean, you dropped that, uh, you know, that, Ooh, that adventure time inspired record mm -hmm. as well this year. And, uh, you know, I, I guess before we dive into anything having to do with that and in regards to everything that you were just saying in terms of certain songs or productions being spun off into other EPs or other things like, uh, I don't know, man. I mean, people tell me that I'm prolific as like a content creator, but I'm even more like in awe of what you do because you just seem to be spinning so many plates at once. And on top of that, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I can't believe how much you are able to like digest, not just like listen to, but you actually really, you know, understand what you're taking. But in. Andrew, every every <laughs> every mutual. project, every project that you do just like has such a different character to it. And on top of it. I feel like a lot of the time, yes, I'm, I'm like digesting a lot, but for the most part, I'm like flexing the same muscle over and over and over. Like, you know, I, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll like, you know, kind of like diverge off into an interview or something like that, you know, once a week or something. But like, <laughs> you know, you're doing, uh, uh, you know, music theory, you're doing, you know, like gear stuff, you're doing like uh, reviews for stuff, you're doing um, uh, 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 classes and sort of like, you know, educational material and that sort of thing. And you're producing and you're composing. It's like, it, uh, do you not feel like when you're creating, I, I guess this is the question. Do you feel like when you're creating and you're engaging in all this stuff, are you ever at a point where you're feeling like you're out of your depth or you're kind of putting yourself in a position where it's a little awkward or you're maybe too inexperienced to do X, Y, or Z, or is it all just like, this is work. This is content. This is the process. It doesn't matter what exactly the message or the concept <laughs> is at the end of the day. I'm just making. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, a thing about some spring reverb, you know, a, a doodad that I got a hold of, or if it's an Adventure Time album, I'm just doing it. It's my focus. It's my vision. I'm going to accomplish it. Yeah, that's a super interesting question. I think it's it's so chaotic. Um, and I I think that I like the challenge. Mm. And so I think I am always just a little bit out of my depth because otherwise it stops being fun for me. Um, and I think the harder thing for me to do would be to like sustain one type of output or content. Um, and I, you know, early in my career, I was really concerned about that because I felt like, oh, I need to have a stronger brand and I need to, people need to be able to expect what's coming next from me or, you know, there needs to be some kind of cohesive aesthetic to all this stuff. Uh, and I feel really lucky that I found a way to make it work without that, because that is just not how I operate or think. And so I, I think what ended up happening was that YouTube kind of became a container for, you know, whatever kind of wacky, like musical mad scientists idea I might have. And so there was a little bit of a, a brand around that, but the actual uh, you know, video to video or music project to music project expression could be so wildly different. And, and, you know, that keeps it interesting. No, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great point. The idea that, um, you're kind of throwing caution to the wind creates a risk factor and makes the whole process exciting and, and fun and worth doing, you know, for you. And, and regardless of how it turns out, you sort of allow the viewer, the audience to be in on that process. And as a result of that, like they have just as much fun just kind of watching you just take part in in doing it. Yeah, I think that's true, too. I think 
you know, a lot of people would watch me do something or create something and get a lot out of it, whether it's entertainment or they're learning how to do their own thing. But even if they don't like the actual thing that I produced, cause they're not into 80s pop rock or, you know, they're not into weird analog synth stuff, but they can uh, identify with the journey of experimenting and making a discovery and, you know, the fun surprises that happen uh, in the creative process and all that exciting stuff. So, yeah, I think it's, it's become so process based. Um, and you know, I, I, it's, it's crazy. I get to, um, reach all these people. Like every once in a while I ask on Twitter or even in a YouTube video, like leave a comment about like who you are and what you do. I just want to know. And then there's graphic designers and architects and, uh, neurosurgeons and like this whole cast of really interesting characters. And only about half of them are actually active musicians themselves, mm. but it's cool that, you know, people from all different fields are getting something out of seeing someone else's process. Yeah. I mean, to, to the, to your point, I mean, I would never personally like probably invest in a whole modular synth rig. I mean, m maybe not now, maybe not now, you know, I, I probably wouldn't go further than like, than like owning a Korg, you know, or like so, yeah, some yeah. Behringer ripoffs or something like that. But, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, it, it is very fun to watch you do it, you know, and, and just sort of like, wow, it's like, it just seems like such a, again, like you said, such a journey. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly fanboying here a little bit. No, I was um, just thinking like the whole, like this, this gesture, I feel like sums up a uh, modular synthesis really well. <laughs> <laughs> like, ugh. Uh, I was I was talking with a friend of mine who uh, uh, does a lot of touring, and a lot of performances. And, you know, he he plays uh, he's a great player and he plays keys himself. And, uh, you know, he works with a lot of samples and synths and electronics and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I asked him, like, you know, would, would you ever um, and I guess I never considered this before. Would you ever like consider like, you know, getting some analog synths or like, you know, doing some uh, modular stuff or anything? He's like. God, no, I, I'm not interested in it at all. All I want to do is like <laughs> just put in the patch and for it to work and just play it and just like go crazy. I'm like, OK, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just a a different personality type, you know, that like. Yeah. Well, and it's so good to know that about yourself, too, because like it's it's a rabbit hole and you right. can get kind of lost in, in doing something that, you know, for some people is really interesting. But then at the end of the day, you're like, OK, I essentially recreated the most basic thing that like any free software could do which is like i i press a button and a note happens right. <laughs> you, know? you know it's it's like honestly you, like you're building it from scratch it's it's honestly um, just like the science behind sound and the science behind music and and you know i, I mm -hmm. think like it, it there's a lot of different ways you can approach music and some people are more of just like a technical kind of compositional mind and, and others are like, for example, I can't remember that one video that you did where you were talking about just like uh, the synthesis of sound and you were um, exploring different sound waves and you were um, talking about the pitches at which sound reverberates you know, within like mm -hmm. these, uh, this synthesis process and the you, harmonic series. Yeah. And the, yes, yes, exactly. And you showed that this tone was actually a bunch of separate tones on top of each other, yeah. which you didn't hear until you just sort of layered them on top of each other. And when you showed that, I was like, holy fucking shit. Like notes <laughs> yeah. are literally just multiple notes on top yeah. of each other. And then it's not chords even are multiple notes on top and each of, of notes. those notes is actually a, a little chord in itself. Exactly. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. You know, which, which again was crazy because like thinking of it in that way, it just like brings so much understanding to the texture and timbre of sound. And that's, and that's a lot of what I talk about at the end of the day anyway. And you know, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it just, it just bring, it, it was an aha moment. It was, a, you know, kind of a, a, a light bulb moment for me because, you know, thinking of the sounds and the way that sound sound being multiple notes on top of each other in terms, you know, on, you know, in, in, in addition to that, like different kinds of textural flavors was just kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That concept still blows my mind to this day. You know, I found out about it some maybe 20 years ago or something and it just, um, it's like so fundamental to how to to our human experience, really anything you hear. Right. But um, you don't really learn it in school. Uh, you don't even learn it in music school until a certain point, maybe. Uh, hopefully that's changing. But yeah, it's it's such a crazy thing. And um, I think that, you know, endless fascination with how that stuff works um just you know will always be interesting to me and there's there's just always going to be something to explore within that um you know to the, to the point you were making earlier about uh 
you know, embarking on projects where you throw caution to the wind a little bit. You just recently came out with another um, first of October record with uh, Rob Scallon. Yeah, Rob Scallon. You, you guys had to forego that last year because of the pandemic, right? Am I right about that? That's right. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now couldn't you, travel so you, between yeah. Thank, Canada and America. Thankfully, you got back into the swing of that then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. So, um, I mean, we weren't going to travel because with the baby, it's so much more complicated. But Rob drove up with his crew to Canada, oh, wow. um, you know, stayed with us for a few days. And we we found a studio right uh, not too far from my place and, um, you know, told the owner there the concept. But Rob brought his own engineer. So we kind of just had run of the place for the day. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great place. And like the concept for those of you who don't know is first of October is a band that only exists every first of October. It's me and Rob Scallon. And so every year on that day, we try to get together and give ourselves 10 to 12 hours to both write and record an entire album. And then like, no matter what we've done, we have to put it on Spotify and, you know, we've got YouTube videos out with it. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's such a, a great time. I feel like we've, weirdly gotten better at it even though every year it's the same like you're starting from scratch and you have to make these 10 songs uh 10 is what we aim for but um yeah we kind of you know we're, we know each other better as writers and performers and uh, we kind of figure out how the flow of the day should go and we're you know the three times we've refined it um but yeah it's it's a very caution to the wind project because you just have to come up with something and and go with it yeah and, and you've had time to digest like the previous projects as well and think about like how certain songs or processes like went over that's true yeah we know you know what genres we can kind of lean on easily mm -hmm. and uh you know, at what point in the day we maybe need to do a song that's only 45 seconds long so that we can put more time into something else. We have like all these little <laughs> tricks, I guess, that we figured out with that. Um, and, you know, it's funny because it's kind of like a microcosm of how songwriting and producing and collaboration works in general, because uh, the same bottlenecks happen. Like lyrics are always the hardest part for me mm. on any project. And it's the same thing there, but condensed into like a one hour little thing and so you know you get the excitement of first coming up with an idea then this like your mini depression of like oh what does it need how do i do this and then kind of remembering what you can add and experimenting and then yeah always that lyric bottleneck or you know coming up with even a, a topic um and then yeah you just just going for it with uh, we get about two takes on anything that's an overdub so we you know we are rehearsing kind of these bed tracks as we're coming up with them. Once we feel like we get a good take of that, we got, you know, 15 minutes to do vocals, harmonies, a lead guitar part, if there is one, a bass guitar. Uh, like, <laughs> so it's one to two takes of everything else. And it's, um, yeah, it's a wild time. What was, you know, would you say the energy, having listened to the record myself, would, would you say in comparison with the previous ones, there was any sort of like energy or vibe difference with these sessions because like I noticed there was a larger amount of like alt metal and like, you know, alternative rock on the record and just like enraged vocals and everything was, was that pent up rage from not getting to do it last year? Was there just like some kind of energy there between everybody? It was like, we, we need to just like go fucking insane and just like come up with the hardest <laughs> riffs we can. Yeah, not not being able to do it last year was a big contributor to the energy of the day because it was just like, I can't believe it. You know, it was a, it was a big just like hug fest, you know, when we all got back together. Um, so I think everyone was just extra stoked for the whole day, really encouraging each other. And um, as far as the sound, yeah, I, I mean, I generally in, in this season of my life just have really felt like like rocking the hell out. I don't know. You know, when I play the guitar these days, I'm just like coming up with these monster riffs and having so much fun and putting distortion to 11 and all that. So I think that was part of it for me. Um, just the, just the vibe going into it. But then also I was not like, I'm not really a screamer in any of my music. I, you know, I break I, it out very occasionally. I know, and then but, I but it was, it was, it was so myself. convincing on the record though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's so few times that I've like gone to that place vocally and never for an entire song. And so that was one of those things that was just in the moment. You know, my my vocals on Bookmobile are the first take. Um, and so Bookmobile is this song I wrote about Rob's mom who drives the Bookmobile in Chicago. She works for the library and uh, she's the nicest lady ever. And 
yeah, for whatever reason, we had talked about her job that morning. And so when it was like, let's think of some lyrics, I just went there and figured out something that I felt like was really fun. And um, as I was delivering it, like I was thinking Rage Against the Machine, as, but I wasn't thinking would. I would go quite like scream with it. I was like, oh, I mean, I know how to rap. We can do that. And I just kept on, you know, incrementing up the uh, energy and yeah, I'm, I'm like honestly surprised and impressed myself with what came out. No, it was, it was insane. It's, it's funny that you describe it as sort of like having a, a rage against the machine kind of angle to it. it. That would kind of make it like the communist bookmobile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we get to get the answer. I mean, it is. Yeah. We're giving away these books. I guess we ask for them back later. Right. But <laughs> um, I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you uh, uh, just about that Adventure Time record before we kind of move on, because oh, sure, uh, I, was, yeah. I was thinking about that show recently because I saw on uh, Twitter, somebody had like posted this uh, um, like Cartoon Network cartoon tier list and like had put Adventure Time, I think in mid tier or low tier or something, which just like what? personally offended me. And Good it, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> it, it made me feel a few different things. It made me feel like, do you, do you not have taste, sir? But then on top of it, I was also thinking, is this a millennial feeling? Am I just feeling this because I'm a millennial? Like, am oh, I, yeah. is it because I'm much older than the person who made this or much younger than the person who made this? And in well, the next- what was at the top of the list? It was, it was actually older cartoons. It was Dexter's Lab. It was like, oh. you know, stuff like from that 90s, Ed, Ed and Eddie, you know, like 90s, 2000s. I guess some of that stuff maybe was bigger overall. I yeah. mean- Dexter's, I, I remember just being on and, all and, the time. And Powerpuff like Girls, that sort of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe Which, those are more. I mean, obviously, like you would put those, region. you would put those cartoons in god tier. Those cartoons are easily god tier. But I, but I think like Adventure Time reaches up into that as well. Just like thinking about how influential oh, yeah. it's been in the modern era and like how creative it is in terms of its like aesthetics and lore. Like you know, in comparison with every other Cartoon Network cartoon. Yeah, yeah. No, it just feels like it went deeper than so many cartoons go it's like god it's it's such a special energy that nothing else is exactly matched and uh yeah i don't know i just thought it thought it had a super you know special place in the canon but I mean, this is just one guy's opinion I guess. no no it's it's true i mean obviously like nothing against the guy at the end of the day but uh but it, it just sort of made me wonder if like over the next 15 years i'm going to be dealing with zoomers being like adventure time sucks like who you're oh, that's going to be a hard world to live in <laughs> Zo zoomers <laughs> zoomers harassing me over my cartoon taste um i can like understand a zoomer making fun of me for you know how i dress right. or like the type of content i make or you know anything but yeah to think of them actually feeling that adventure time is just not a good cartoon that uh, it's hard to get yeah, I mean, the, the cartoon is like so gentle and twee much of the time and, and even when it is like doing some badass stuff like you know fighting in dungeons or whatever it's still cute even when it's doing that like i can't understand why the next generation wouldn't take to that but um yeah. but you know oh, to, cool. to, to get into another aspect of the show just the musical world of the show is just so wonderful and interesting and texture rich but also like I don't know. It, it, a lot of the music from that show also reminds me of when I was getting into a lot of underground lo-fi indie music in college, like, you know, Cassia Tone for the Painfully Alone or some mm. shit like that, or Adam and His Package, you know, like weird DIY producers that uh, just made their uh, music on children's toys or some other, you know, weird stuff with like, you know, low grade recording equipment. And, uh, you know, I, I guess like, is is that a, a world that I guess kind of captured you or a sound that captured you about? Um, the 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 soundtrack of the show generally i mean i i guess what i'm saying is that's my attraction to a lot of the musical aesthetics of the show you know what 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 has drawn you yeah. in about the music of the show to the point where you had to make kind of an album and tribute to it yeah i mean it's all the same kind of stuff uh yeah definitely that um you know kids toys and uh loose playful vibe all the the texture for sure is important like it's so much more than you know what notes he's decided to use and it's it's very um very sound driven and i think more than even a lot of the soundtrack stuff i really loved the interstitial like i don't know if interstitial is the right word but right before every episode you know they have kind of a still they have a painting that shows the title sure, of that sure, sure. episode and and there's something going on there for like 5 seconds yeah. and i've rewound those parts probably more than the actual story parts of adventure time that I think are really cool, just because there's something so interesting about each of those 
um, pieces, like they're their own little world. Every single one feels completely unique. And at the same time, it's like, it feels like you didn't have to work very hard on it. Like it feels so loose and like it just came out of nowhere. But then at the same time, when I try to, you know, capture that vibe, I get nowhere close. And like, I don't know, I think there's moments of it on that that album that I did. Um, but mostly I, I just am more kind of thinking about the attitude of it when I'm going into it, where it's just like playful and textural. But um, yeah, there's something super special about how, I don't know. There's like next level quirkiness to it all that just I think is very particular to uh, Casey James who who wrote it. No, I I I, I, I was just gonna say I I honestly am blanking on his last name because in one video I called him Casey James Basilisk as a joke and now it's just Casey James Basilisk to me. Anyway, um, no, I, I I agree. I mean, there are a lot of shows, including Adventure Time, that have that kind of that classic character to their title card music if you could just call it the title card music like spongebob mm, yeah. is pretty legendary for that oh, also yeah. like um all the stuff uh back in the day mark mothers bob devo did for the rugrats you know cartoon yes. during those title cards like his i actually visited their uh studio oh, yeah? last time i was in la a while ago now oh cool but um they, it's like used to be a dentist's office that but it was like a perfectly circular building it looks like a spaceship and so there's a central room where they record in and then all these rooms around it that are just full of the weirdest instruments you've ever heard of. Um, didn't get to meet Mark. He wasn't there, mm -hmm. but um, it, was a, it was a fun, fun tour. And uh, yeah, you can just imagine like how they would come up with the weird stuff they do in, in that kind of an environment. Um, you know, I mean, I guess speaking of Mark or I guess, you know, artists who are kind of of that legendary status in general, like when you first started getting into music, either as a musician or just as a fan, like, you know, are, are, are figures like that you know, uh, early on in your teen years or maybe like later into your twenties, like, you know, kind of your go-tos in terms of inspiration or, you know, I, I, I guess like for as much as I hear you talk about music, it's rare that I hear you talk about like, Oh, this is my favorite artist, or this was like my favorite artist mm. from back in the day, or, you know, this is like the first band at this time or first record I picked up at this time. Like, you know, what, what was like, you know, your musical diet, like around the time of like, I don't know, um, music to wear pants to that sort of thing. Like around that time, yeah, like yeah. what were some of your favorite artists and groups that you heard? My, my taste got so eclectic from such an early age. And, um, you know, I really love all different kinds of music and it's always been that way. And, and I just, you know, every time I discover something new, like it might be bossa nova or it might be Brazilian samba, or it might be, you know, like ace of bass or something. And I just be like, that's a cool different sound. And I'd get really into it. So, you know, in kind of my formative music years, and I was probably around 14 when I decided, you know, music is really the thing that I like the most and that I want to pursue. I was listening at that time to like No Effects and Miles Davis and Autecker and Radiohead and, um, you know, Billie Holiday. Like it was just so all over the place. Um, and it's kind of always been that way. Um, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's it's so hard to, to pinpoint very particular musical influences because um, it's, yeah, it's just this big. Oh, I mean, blur. well, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying for you to be like, oh, well, this record inspired me to do this. You know, I'm, I'm just saying like, yeah, yeah. you know, just as a casual music fan, like what were you really enjoying and just what was really speaking to you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, those artists and um, I definitely, you know, I think the, the biggest things for me were um, the various forms of jazz mm. for a period of time. And then, uh, yeah, I could, could kind of see this like three pronged thing happening in my teen years where it was like a bunch of jazz that was really interesting that my music teacher at high school was, was introducing me to. And then all of the like rock stuff that was coming out of the time, alt rock stuff. Um, and then, uh, the third part of that would just be like basically warp records, but you know, kind of the, the underground electronic stuff that was happening around the late nineties. Um, that was super exciting. And to me still, you know, there's nothing like that era of, of that particular like electronic genre. Um, yeah, I don't know. I go back to that stuff a lot. No, I, I had like, um, I mean, obviously I was into not as I, I was more into like, you know, new metal than pop punk around like that mm. era of time. As far as like electronic stuff, I hadn't gotten into Autech or as much as I had gotten into Square Pusher, like and, oh, and yeah, just like also, more drum yeah. and bass stuff. And and I guess yeah. like that led me down a jazz hole at one point. And um, 
Uh, and and then like beyond that, I I just got more into old school punk music. You know, I, I think like mm. a lot of the newer pop punk stuff wasn't doing too much for me outside of like Blink-182 and, you know, a few other bands. But then like when a friend of mine turned me on to like Ramones and Dead Kennedys and so on and so forth, that caused like a totally different rabbit hole. And, and I live not too far from a record store where I could just like indulge in that all day endlessly yeah. with like no breaks. And, and then that, you know, then I landed here talking to you. So, I mean, you know, it's like that's that was that was the process <laughs> with that. Yeah, no, it feels like, you know, two music obsessed people that just, you know, couldn't help but <laughs> have it overflow into everything they ended up doing and talking about. Right, exactly. Um, so uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, with with the birth of your child and the recent projects coming out, I mean, you know, uh, uh, this this recent, you know, space themed record is, is a pretty huge one for you conceptually and um you know, uh, uh, visually as well uh, with, with all this being done, do you see this right now as kind of being maybe a new chapter or maybe an opportunity to reset or think about things differently? Or do you see yourself moving from this point as having kind of that same kind of eclectic, wild, uh, I guess, prolific kind of energy and attitude toward everything you do, you know, or, or do you feel like in a way, like, is it time to get more ambitious or do an even larger project? Like, do you feel any pressure for the next album you do to push an even larger narrative or go further in some way? Uh, I don't think there's more ambition. No, I think, I mean, the, the ambition now is, is divided because it, you know, I have a music thing and then I have my family. Right. And so, and, and that's great. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's this thing about me that, the, the energy of this seeps into almost everything I do, I think, but um, I'm just not so much for, for a very short period of time. I was like really building. I was like giving a hundred percent of everything in my life to YouTube uh, for about 18 months. It was like two videos a week. Uh, in that period of time, I grew to a million subscribe or I grew a million subscribers. I'd already had a couple hundred thousand or something when I started that. So it was like a, crazy period of growth and, um, output. And, um, I think that kind of turned me off of, of like huge amounts of ambition for a while or maybe for life. Cause I don't know, it was, it was just very, uh, exhausting mm. and, you know, super fun. And I'm glad I did it. And it kind of laid a foundation for me, but I'm really happy now that I can chill more. Mm. So, um, yeah, space time was the last like mega thing that I, um, wanted to put out um, uh, you know, right now looking to the future, I'm just thinking I'm going to make whatever content comes to mind. I'm thinking like a few months ahead at most. And, um, yeah, that, that might just be how it is. And I'm, you know, really, you know, being able to, to put a lot of energy into, uh, the kid, but, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just not even like really concerned about the career stuff. I'm like, it's just going to be what it is. And, uh, I really love being able to do whatever I feel like doing in a given season. And I've made that work so far mm -hmm. and we're going to hope I can continue to do that. No, for sure. I mean, and not to insinuate or ask that question out of like, you know, uh, uh, a desire to pressure you to do anything different, but I think, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's important to, I think, highlight you as a different kind of breed of musician and artist and content creator. You know, you're not like this industry type who is kind of putting all of their eggs into this one singular album basket. And, you know, you're kind of building upon that for years and years and years. And then there's this like kind of grand rollout for it. You know, you are, um, you know, showing that there's kind of like a different path and a different mode and you're showing like a lot of success with it and a lot of creativity throughout all of it too. So, um, you know, I, I guess like uh, to kind of, you know, finally put a bow on this point, like, you know, that more, I guess, industry or commercial type of uh, uh, mode, like, you know, does that ever interest you or does that ever tempt you? Or is that more of just like a grass is greener on the other side of the fence sort of thing for you at this point? It's a really uh, my relationship with like industry stuff. I think I've I've struggled with at different times, and um, I mean, definitely, you know, when I was younger, that was kind of the dream. It was like, oh, wouldn't it be great to be on tour and have a magazine interview me, and you know, put out a record, and uh, you know, watch it get reviewed. The, the, the um, needle drop is interviewing, and that's just as good in 2021. I think. <laughs> I think. Yeah. That's the, oh, that's the equivalent in, this day in 2020. Age, it's, it's, it's the top. It's the same. It's the same in 2021. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've like kind of gone back and forth with just how much I want to engage on the commercial side of things uh, at different times in my life. And right now I'm really comfortable just kind of doing what I'm doing and, and not thinking about that too much. And I have uh, friends that are kind of in different degrees uh, of the industry and um, it's just a lot of it doesn't look attractive from the inside. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I get into some, I, I, I barely ever do these anymore. It's only like when I really like someone, do I collaborate, but you know, there was a period of time where I was just like doing sessions and meeting people and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, you know, sometimes you meet really cool people and, and that's awesome. But a lot of it is just, you work on something with someone that you won't really see again and you don't put anything out and then, yeah, it just doesn't feel like uh, a fun way to spend your creativity. Um, and yeah, and I definitely, you know, when you're saying uh, about putting all your eggs into one album basket, like that is a very volatile thing. And I feel really lucky that I don't have to do that, um, both like from a financial point of view, because if something, you know, tanks, then you're like really effed. But also like almost worse, I think, would be the emotional fallout from that, because if you are putting your heart and soul into something and you also have to depend on it for your livelihood and then people don't like it, you're it's it's like I would bet you couldn't help but feel that chip at your self-worth you know what i mean like that you would really be um <laughs> d depending on on some kind of feedback from that and i think uh yeah that's just kind of a scary thought for me i don't know no and then i don't know we could go even deeper into like all the the capitalist structures around like why we even have to put music in these packages and disseminate them the way we do and what it's worth and all that but um yeah i think i'm i'm just feeling good about being a little bit freer, uh, from, from those kinds of things. No, I, I, I think it's a great point. And Hey, you know, I, if we had more time, I wouldn't mind getting into the capitalist structures, but, um, you know, it, it makes me think of someone like, uh, you know, Mike Shinoda of Lincoln park who, you know, as far as like the music industry is as much a veteran as, you know, you can, mm -hmm. you could get, but you know, what is he doing now? He is on Twitch how, however many times a week making beats lives for fans with fans sometimes doing like commissions and stuff sometimes uh just putting them together into these little beat projects and uploading them randomly to streaming platforms like he probably would have been doing what you're doing now earlier had it been an option in 1999 you know what i mean yeah. like i i think you know what we're seeing people like you do is just kind of a, a a natural occurrence of just the ability to do it the opportunity to do it and it just wasn't there prior and maybe this is something that wouldn't be seen as weird and would be more the normal if it had just been around longer um so, you know, off of that, I wanted to ask you, you know, with this kind of attitude and mentality and this willingness to kind of stay and hang more in that on online space, you know, you've had quite a, a progression up until this point, you know, going from commissioning tracks on eBay to, you know, becoming a full time YouTube content creator and, and all of the avenues through which that's kind of spouted. But like over the next decade with, you know, obviously the rise of Twitch and TikTok and how many other platforms are probably going to, you know, um, bubble up over the next 10 years. Like, do you see the need for your content or content delivery delivery method or style to change in any significant way um, in, in the immediate future in order to continue engaging with the audiences that you want to reach, uh, you know, get the, get the eyes that you need to get in order to, you know, continue uh, building your Andrew Huang empire. Yeah. Um, the, empire. Yeah, the empire, you know, what's really funny is back in the songs to our pants day, two days, I was thinking this, you know, this was just a stupid, fun, far away dream that I had, but I was like, what if I build stuff to the point that I could have two skyscrapers connected by a bridge at the top. So it looked like a giant pair of pants in the city. <laughs> that was like my, like, you know, if, if I could just keep on going and if things keep going well, that's what I want to build right. to. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's what my empire would look like. If, one day. if you but, could have uh, commissioned a song for like a billion on eBay, you know, yeah, it, it yeah, would, yeah. Gone that's there. where I'd be. Yeah. In my studio right at the top in the fly. Oh, there would be like an elevator to be the fly right. just for that part of the building. Um, yeah, I, 
definitely, you know, I've, I've always kind of rolled with the punches and, and changed some things when I felt like I needed to or wanted to. I think that that could happen. I, I guess one thing um, that I have been thinking is I want to do longer YouTube videos. I think there's a time and a place for like the high energy, short, snappy stuff. But I'm also I'm watching more of the longer stuff on YouTube. A lot of the longer stuff on YouTube is performing better since they really like uh, you, you know, they want watch time. Like, like um, Adam Neely type stuff or like some, somebody else, like who do you, who are you having? I mean, Adam mind? Neely, yeah, is, is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, he does um, a lot of good long form stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's people making even, um, stuff that's almost podcasty in mm -hmm. a way, yeah. uh, maybe with a guest, maybe not. Uh, but you know, someone who's just kind of gently walking you through something that they're, working. I mean, for me, it's a lot of like synth videos, of course, but, uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, realizing that there's a place for that kind of content as well within what I do. So that's one thing, but yeah, I, I don't necessarily feel the need to jump on every possible thing. Like I streamed a few times and felt like maybe if I were all set up and, and made this easy for myself, I could do this, but I don't know if it's exactly my energy as like a regular thing. And then, um, TikTok, I, really put a good effort in for a little bit just to like, you know, see what it was all about. It, it was really big. I mean, it still is huge. Um, and I, you know, in a month got to a hundred thousand followers there and I was like, okay, sick. I kind of know what this is about, but I just don't enjoy the process of making these. So I'll just make one whenever I feel like I have a good idea for one, which as it turns out is like twice a year. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really prioritize fun for me. Right. And I think that's sort of the, the overall ultimate aim is like the YouTube videos are the most fun right now. And hopefully they'll continue to be and continue to be watched. And yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I guess at the same time, I think we're in an interesting place where we're going to be the first people to see what this kind of age of content creators is going to be like as they age. Yeah. Um, we're going to become content because, boomers. Yeah, hundred percent. Maybe we already are. And uh, the interesting thing I think with that is, like, you're gonna be able to see this entire body of work and have like instant access to it. And maybe you stumble across a video from twenty years ago, and then you realize you're watching someone who is now like an old man. I don't know. Um, but it's a completely different experience from what I mean from from anything we've ever been in before as a you know as a species. And it's just like. Uh, we don't really know what it's going to be like. Like, are the audiences just going to completely age with us because they can and we, you know, with the internet have the power to publish just as much as we did when we were, you know, younger and hotter and whatever. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, does... When we were younger does, and does more fuckable. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuckability is so important in this industry. It's true. And I mean, or, or does it just fall apart like everything does as you age? You know, is it just like, ah, oh, people are less interested in that. And even though I've been watching you since we were both 20 and now we're all 50, I still just want to watch 20 year olds. I don't know. Maybe that's what it's going to be like. But... <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't even remember the original question we came from here, but no, I mean, look, I, I, I think so far this is boding well for you because until I looked it up, I thought you were 10 years younger than me. So I, I, I think it's going to be a while yeah, before people there. are like, yeah, Andrew Huang, that old fuck, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm over that. Guy. <laughs> um, hey, I just got a, a giant raid here from Hassan. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it so much, dude. All right. Yeah. We, now we have 9,000 people watching. Um, Damn. Who just, who just popped in, who just 9,000 people <laughs> like instantly. Uh, right now we're talking with Andrew Huang. Uh, you should check out his YouTube channel. He's a great musician, producer, composer, everything. Uh, check him out. He's got lots of records on streaming as well. Uh, and hey, thank you for the subs. Again, greatly appreciate it. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think we're at one point going to reach an age where we're just like content boomers and we have to kind of like, you know, reckon with the fact that we might have to start doing things on a different platform. Um, you know, and, and, and in terms of like your audience growing with you, I think it's going to depend on who you are and the content you make. You know, I, I, in my mm -hmm. experience, like a lot of the, you know, music I review you know, appeals to like that college age demographic, you know what I mean? Because it's a lot of underground shit and it's a lot of indie shit and, you know, it's a lot of more cutting age, cutting edge mainstream stuff. And, you know, I'm at an age where I'm coming to terms with the fact that like a lot of the bands that I loved in college or, you know, uh, was excited to like hype up on my channel when I first started my YouTube, uh, my YouTube channel are like dead or they suck now. 
And <laughs> like yeah. now all of the, you know, artists who, um, uh, that I'm reviewing who are newer, you know, it's like, they're from a totally different generation. You know, honestly, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of like Tyler, the creator, um, oh, yeah. you know, it's been really cool kind of seeing him grow and change artistically and aesthetically over the years, but like that's a decade in the can at this point. And when odd future popped off, I felt old when that happened. I was too old to get an odd future when odd future popped off and now I'm even older. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and, yeah. And, so there's going to be like a zoomer Fantano who comes along. <laughs> Maybe, you know, and, it's, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll get replaced by a zoomer Fantano or people will just start being like, why does this old guy have so many opinions on music that I listen to? I, I really have no idea. I'm, I'm hoping and fingers crossed that like people see that I've been doing this for, for so long. And they're like, oh, well, that he just does that. You know what I mean? It's because yeah. no other guy would do that. <laughs> You know what I hope for all of us is that we manage to grow into uh, like Batty Winkle energy. Do you know Batty Winkle? No, tell she's like a, me. I think mostly she's an Instagram person, mm -hmm. um, but she is basically like 90 years old or something and just the coolest grandma. Like that's, that's, she wears amazing shit all the time. That's my, that's, that's my game plan in. because I yeah. know that there's yeah. always a market for really old people online. So, I mean, I figure what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep doing this. And then maybe when I'm like, you know, pushing or hitting 40, it's going to drop off and then it'll, you know, mm -hmm. and then obviously like, you know, that'll go horribly and that'll be depressing. And then maybe I'll just like start aging really fast and aging really terribly over the next 10 years. And then once that happens, I think things will start going back up because it's like, you know, nobody cares about a 40 year old reviewing music, but like, do people care about an 85 year old reviewing music? Yeah. Probably, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I, I, I think okay, it'll, yeah, it'll come glad back. We figured this out. We got our game. It'll come back around. It'll come back around. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's great. You know, if I need to take some time off, I got the family to raise and that'll be wonderful. And then I'll come back and just be a weird old man, you know, exactly doing my modular synth stuff. And <laughs> exactly. And and yeah. like, are you know, are you really excited to like start uh, uh, passing off like this musical knowledge to, you know, to 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 your children and, and start, you know, oh, like, more than anything. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Evelyn, I don't know anything about what a regular baby would do. Right. I mean, and there's also no such thing as a regular baby, but it felt like from a really young age, like a couple months, she would recognize melodies that I would sing to her. Like there were ones that would always get a smile. And then there were other ones where she would just stare at me blankly. And I'm like, OK, you do like the Beatles and you don't like Smash Mouth. That's a great sign so far. And then, it's, you know, depend, I play her. That, that's debatable, but go on. <laughs> that's, that's debatable. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she won't appreciate memes. Right. Um, yeah. I just like, I play her music all the time and uh, it's so fun to see, you know, her eyes light up with a, a new song she's learning. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm so excited to see if, if she's as interested in it as me, we're going to have so much fun stuff to share. Um, yeah. I mean, like it's, it's the weirdest thing, like having a kid, how it just, that's the most important thing to you and and where you get the most joy. And, um, and I'm loving that. No, oh, for sure. Um, and look, I greatly appreciate you coming on here and just, uh, you know, letting us know about that experience and just, uh, everything else that we've talked about, obviously, uh, you know, with you having so many irons in the fire at any given time, um, you know, is there anything that, you know, viewers and fans should be looking forward to in the immediate future in terms of like musical output or YouTube output that you're working on right now? Right now, I'm uh, only thinking a few videos ahead at a time mm -hmm. and there's nothing crazy coming on YouTube, but just the, the usual shenanigans, experimenting with sound and, and writing stuff. Um, my app flip sampler, which is iOS only right now, but we're working on Android. It's like just this fun sampling beat making thing. Um, we're, we're bringing MIDI to it and we're hoping we can release that on Christmas so that we can like, you know, integrate it into more stuff, you know, control a vocal with it or whatever you want to do. Um, so that's a fun thing. And, uh, I mean, if you want to learn music from me, there's my course is always, uh, running a few times a year, monthly.com slash Andrew is the thing, but yeah, otherwise, uh, I'm just chilling with my baby. Okay. We'll leave a link to that down below on YouTube and with, you know, all your other socials and, and everything like that. And again, I appreciate you taking the time and coming on. Yeah, dude. Thanks so much. It's been fun. And, uh, it's great to finally chat with you. All right. Have a good one, man.